I'm sure we are, he's the APT chairman. So I believe today we are honored, isn't it? We have got the man himself. So if we've got any issue that you want clarifications on, please visit the platform. But I believe so far we've worked quite a journey. If you look at where we started off from and where we are today, I believe we are now quite different people in terms of our level of understanding and comprehension of issues, which is the whole objective of this course. Obviously, culminating in you writing the APC in November. So for this class, we know that uh, the schedule was a bit tight from some of us writing the supper assessment over the weekend and also expecting to do some of this preparation. So I know some of us may not have had ample time to do all the requisite preparation, but we still ask you that to be attentive. Isn't it? Some of the work can then do it post class, applying the issues we have discussed in this session. But for those who are able to, I believe you're able to review your assessment to performance and also reviewed case study four, which was the APC 2018, as well as downloaded case study seven, the medical case study from the APC 2017 in preparation for this session. <coughs> How many of us were able to do so? Only a few of us were too worried about the salary assessment. And by the way, how was the salary assessment? <laughs> I'll take it to mean that everything was fine. You were flying through the tasks. You can't just wait to get your HC grade. And then for now, let's talk more about the salary assessment. I believe it's now what under the bridge. So today, what do we seek to achieve? One of the things we want to do are when we do a quick rundown on feedback from assessment two. Yes, specifically looking at what were the lessons learned from assessment two, which you now need to, unless as we now prepare for our final APC examination. So I'm going to discuss around the exam preparation to say, now that you've done all the assessments for the formal assessment part of this program, what should we do going forward? I know the temptation for most of us would be, it's time for me to take a holiday. And then wait for the day the pre-release is going to come through. But we encourage you not to stop to do the work. We need to keep building on the momentum that we had gathered today, isn't it? So by the time you get to the APC in November, you are already at the peak of your preparedness. Which is why we are going to discuss a number of things that we expect you to be doing from now up until you write your APC. Then I believe you have also known that if you look at the nature and context of our case studies, they try as much as possible to capture the realities in the business environment. So I'm going to do a brief discussion around the current affairs, both from a global perspective and a local perspective. So that as you go again and start preparing for your APC, you are aware of these issues and you can research further on these issues. So at least when you then attempt the case studies, Current affairs context is also properly captured in your responses. Then lastly, I'm going to discuss how to use the APC 2018 and the APC 2017 assessments. So let's now reflect. Personally, I'm a huge fan of reflection. And I, if you ask my student that I teach a CTA and ITC, my motto is the times I know it's CTA and ITC. One of the things that we do as students as part of our preparation, we say I need to do many practice questions. So maybe we've got a question with 100 questions. Your target is I need to do 100 questions. But my personal view is it's not about the quantum of the question that you do, but it's all about the quality of the reflection that you do after doing a, a question. But that's where the learning is going to happen. So we then speak to say when we wrote the assessment too, I know for those who are asked to write the supplementary exams, we then also we had to quickly get in the mood mode for preparing for the supplementary exam. And may not have enough time to reflect on assessment too. So what we are now requesting you to do is to take a step back, look at how you did in assessment two, and even go and spend a big assessment one. You are reflecting on your performance to date. What areas did you do well in? Which areas do you need to 
to improve one, isn't it? And if you look at East Bay assessment two, your case study was based on a Kanban operating within the logistics industry. Yep. But when you look at the logistics industry, and I believe for most of us when we did the industry research, the Kanban that we were able to quickly find from a local from a Zimbabwean perspective was really free, isn't it? But was dynamic exactly the same as Unifred? If you look at their business models, they're not exactly the same. Anymore. So then doing your analysis and research, are you able to identify those differences? Because if you look at dynamic supply, they tried as much as possible to leverage on technology in terms of the way they did their, their, their business. But then maybe from a research on Unifreight, they were not yet at that, was, at that level. So industry research should also allow you to say, the company that we've been given to case study, how does it differ from the competitors that we've identified from, from the case study or from the industry research? Then another aspect that I believe we are seeing within this program, if you look at how you did your CTA and your ITC, when you got into the exam, confirm with the defined syllabus that we were working with. And the chances of surprise was a bit minimal. To say you knew that, for example, in IFRS 9, if age accounting was stopped out, you don't need to worry about age accounting. Either. But in this, in the APC, you can get totally new things that you have never, ever, ever seen before in your life. We could talk about new terms. And I know the classical one from the assessment too was the, the raw data approach. For most of us, okay, what is this thing? And I believe we all went to Google with it. Okay, what is raw data approach? Then you've got a few texts or a lot of information on the raw data approach. But the question is, what exactly should you be doing with new text? So some new terms can be industry specific, isn't it? So given the industry that is being triggered, you have no prior working knowledge of that particular industry. So you are going to get a new terminology coming from that particular industry, isn't it? So what then do you do? And I believe in the last class I shared with you that my personal view for any new term is to use YouTube. Visualize it. We look at a new term, Rolex. What is it? Maybe you saw in the case study an actual strike. What is it? Go on YouTube, isn't it? Visualize what we are talking about. Then you can then apply that visualization in the context of the, of the case study we have given you. So now, Can someone assist me here? What do you think is the importance of industry research? Because confirm you never get a task on industry research. So why do we do it? I believe now we're working with Jenny together. Why do we do it? Yes. It helps you relate to the business such that even as you answer some of the things you can apply in your answers and whatever new thing may come with information of the day, you can relate it with your contextual. Okay, so she's saying main thing is to allow the contextualization. So for example, if let's take a business like uh, I'll take a mining entity simplex. They come to you with the if we shifting problem, and Econet Zimbabwe also come to you with an if we shifting problem. Confirm how you are going to solve the problem can differ it because of the different context that you are dealing with. How does Zimplas generate this revenue? What are the peculiar issues to Zimplas? When you go to Econet, what are the peculiar issues to us to Econet? And that's the only way you can properly solve the problems. So what is the emphasis here? To say whenever you are doing our industry research, let's always keep in mind why are we doing this? Because again, the risk is we just go on an information gathering spree without appreciating, say, what about that information? Why do I need it? How then do I use it? Especially on the day of the, of the assessment. So it brings us to importance of contextualization and synthesis. 
I had a chat with some of you guys, it's not the girl that I met, to say, okay, Elliot, I saw the trigger. And yes, I did some work on the trigger. But the only problem was, the work that was done was, was divorced from context in the case study. But he went on and did the work. But what was the question asked in the trigger? So the classical one I would say is the generation Z trigger in assessment two. I believe all of us we saw that trigger. And all of us most likely would Google who is generation Z <coughs> and you got some information. And then we got a lot of text around generation Z. But we forgot why we wonder about generation Z in the case study. Which meant that we then didn't go a step further to say, now that I know who is generation Z. So within the context of dynamic supply, why are we even thinking about generation Z? Which is where contextualization comes into, into place. It. Okay. So always keep that in mind whenever you're looking at information. What is the context? You yeah, are looking at a, at a taking out trigger. You have not been asked to go and read an IFI standard or auditing standard. What problem or what potential problem is the man going to try to, to solve? Therefore, I need to read that context in, in mind. IOD and tasks. On this one, again, I believe there's been a lot of learning that has happened. Most of you in assessment one, you got in the assessment with more or less pre-prepared answers or you had positions that you had taken. And what did it mean? When you got the IOD, and normally the IOD gives you further clarification or can change some variables. So with that new context which is brought on the day, are you able to contextualize your thing this way to the new context you get on the day of the, of the exam? Which again something that you need to practice and work on them and reflect on how good was I in being able to connect the dots from the pre list to the I.O. to the I.O.T. Which then allows you to properly tackle any task that you might, you might get. Then another interesting thing that we saw from the assessment too was if you look at dynamic supply, broadly speaking, dynamic supply was a logistics business. But within that business model, the other thing that they started to do is so when I didn't like the concept of telematics, what is this? I also had to Google the name when I saw it. When you talk about telematics, but when you got these slides before class, when you read the this is telematics, I, I would have thought you have also maybe Google it. Anyway. Telematics. So I'm saying, in simple terms, telematics are around long range communication technology. So you'll find, if you look at the business model for dynamic supply, they wanted to be able to track their traffic. So with a track, for example, that is in one gate day, you need to be able to know where it is exactly. What time did it get to one gate? Were there any delays along the way? What happened? So that's a new. <coughs> a new development within the logistic industry. So again, if you look at the 2018 APC, the assessment was, or the case study was, a, it was a hotel business. But you'd find that this, the way they were doing the, their hotel business was a bit more technologically advanced than the hotel that you'd find local. So in doing your research, are you able to pick up that context? So as an example, the 2018 APC, to check in, a guest didn't need to go to talk to a client the personnel at the second desk. They'll check in on their, on their, or you get in there, when you, had, when you book, you get a confirmation court. So when you walk up to the hotel, you just go to your room in there, and you check in yourself. Which is different to the current model that is being used. So when you are going through the case studies, are you able to pick up these variations to what you ordinarily see practically? 
more so given the fact that unfortunately as a country, I believe we are now lagging a bit behind it to what other countries are doing. But if you look at your case studies, they are not set to say, if you look at Zimbabwe, you compare maybe to European countries, we are a bit like 10 years or 20 years behind. Therefore, let's prepare the case studies, focus on only on what can happen with the Zimbabwe business landscape. The case study will still give you what's happening within those developed countries. So a business model that is prevalent, maybe in China, that is prevalent in the US, maybe which is not as prevalent in what? In Zimbabwe. So how do you do the conciliation? When you are doing your industry research, it's very, very important. So now, quickly, if I look at assessment two, there was something interesting about assessment two, which I highlighted in the sub-intervention class. So assessment two had a lot of technical tasks, isn't it? If you notice, it had a lot of technical tasks, but there was also something interesting about assessment two. In most of the tasks, we had more than one problem to address. Did you notice? In most of the tasks, we had more than one problem to address. So the question is, when you then prepare your response, number one, as part of your planning, did you identify the specific problems you needed to address? <coughs> because one of the feedback comments I'm giving my guys are made on this. At a minimum, let's say I look at task A. It had four matters to be dealt with. Then as you are doing your planning, if we don't address all four matters, we are not saying whether correctly or incorrectly, just addressing them. If you address all four on coverage of tick, do you say coverage of dealt with all four what? matters? Then we go to the quality of what we have said. We are not dealing with the definition. So it means, at a minimum, coverage should be there. Can we agree? At a minimum, no matter what happens, address all what? Four matters. Because you know that if things go wrong, maybe in one of the matters, you are not going to be, maybe you can still lay within a season. But say, most you are saying, okay, you address all four matters, out of the four, three were well done, maybe one not quite so well. You can still be you can still be graded as a competent. Level. But if you fail to address all four, let's say you address two, and you do brilliantly in those two, and don't address the other two, your chance of getting a C are next to zero. Do you agree? Because you are saying you have not dealt with the issue that I gave you to, to address. Therefore, there's no way I'm going to take you away. And, and say yes, it's fine now. It has to be redone. Because coverage is poor. So I think this aspect really came in. If you look at assessment two, more so task A, which had four issues to be addressed. Then task A, it is an embedded ethical issue that came through them. Remember, it was, there was a discussion around should we redraw the contract with them and then beg them to allow dynamic supply to be able to claim the capital allowance. So over and above giving a technical position on that matter, we expect it to be able to identify the ethical issue that is arising. Why? Because if you look at ethics, in most of the decisions we make, chances are high they are ethical considerations. If I decide to take this course of action, just ask yourself, are there any potential ethical <coughs> issues that may arise that I would need to worry about or to be conscious, to be conscious of? Which, one, which is what task A was trying to illustrate and demonstrate for, for us. So here I just reflecting. Then task B, the interesting part about task B, it was the I think the trigger was quite apparent in the, in the previous information. And because the trigger was quite apparent, all of us in the court of the listing rules, on the job of the assessment, we also kept the court of our national court and corporate governance. Now when the task came through, 
The temptation for some of us was then to do a theory now. Because we are told that with reference to section 73, the listing rules, with reference to the disclosure requirement of the National Code of Corporate Government, but did the task ask us to just dump theory? Or there were problems for us to solve using section 73 requirements? So I'm saying going forward, we need to be very careful with this type of task. We have got the apparent triggers and it has got a lot of theory behind it. Because the temptation is then to just go in and dump the theoretical content, but without really applying what you have, or without really solving the problem given. And in this one, I will equate it in, 20, in the 2017 APC. In the 2017 APC, I think it was task A. And if it was an if is 16 tasks. There was an apparent trigger in the pre-release. And most candidates did a lot of theoretical research on if 16. And when the task came through, it was a very simple task. Most candidates then went the route of dumping if 16 deal. Why? Because we have done so much theoretical research on if 16. Without thinking how they did it apply to Millennia or Togo. Therefore, what possible problems could emanate from the 16 <coughs> issues that are relevant to Millennia Togo? <coughs> so, that the other thing is, whenever you look at this technical task, it's not just about gathering theoretical knowledge, but thinking about the context of or how it can be assessed. So, task C again, another technical task, we have to evaluate financing options. And I believe that there was a trigger in the IOT around whether we should go out and get a lease or we should get a, a loan. Then in the, on the day of the assessment, the special asks, can you evaluate the options that have been given? So in this one, I think some of us struggled with our technical foundation. How do I evaluate a financing decision. And I believe from our city and ITC, some of us have got our best subject. Mm -hmm. It's always coming back to bond us now and then. So when you see the trigger, what should you do? It's an, it's an area that you think technical, you don't have a strong foundation. What should you do? <coughs> Any take -out? You have seen the trigger. So, okay, the trigger is expecting me to evaluate financing options. But I'm yet to be given any further details around the financing options. And it's just afraid to say, ah, do I have at least some knowledge around how to evaluate financing options? Or you feel that it's not it's your weak area. What do you do? Any takers? Yes. No, I'll go back maybe to my notes, ITC or the ITC notes in terms of that particular area. Just to give a quick recap of the key, uh, key shall we say, technical points that I need to remember before I start applying it to the scenario I've got. Okay, so he's saying, I will go back maybe to my ITC notes or CTA notes, just to go and reflect on the key principles. So I like the word reflecting <coughs> on the key principles. Versus like trying to go and read with the whole syllabus. And you are reflecting within the context of your trigger. When I go back, what do I want to know? What do I want to refresh my mind on? So that when I then come back to the case study, at least I'm happy that I've now got the grounding of the principles required. And that's where, remember like I said, the sub-intervention. Where outsourcing of the work is will not work in. On the other words, it will not work in. <laughs> <laughs> so it means you need to do the work yourself, isn't it? Because you know your own personal or individual limitations or shortcomings. Say, ah, in this area, I've always had a problem. So for you to prepare for that area, don't solely rely on your group discussion. You need to do your own individual 
work, because you know your problems, rather than trying to outsource your problems to other group members. So I said that's my advice on areas that we, on technical areas that you may not just sound grounding on. If it's 15, fairly straightforward person, but the problem with if it's 15, every studio when they think about if it's 15, the first thing that comes to your mind is what? Five step mode, don't you? And I'm sure when you saw the trigger, it went and read on the five step. When the task came through, you had to do it. I demonstrated my knowledge on the five step mode. And that one was asked. So the task scoped out certain things. Say, my friend, okay, don't worry about contract identification. We know it's part of the five step model. But what did some of us do? Say, no, 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 I still want to show you. I, I know how to identify a contract. One, you are wasting your time. And two, in the eyes of the mark, what's happening? <coughs> We are now moving towards in the wrong direction, isn't it? Besides, the are told you not to deal with this issue. But you still went on to and dealt with it. So we are now moving in the wrong direction. So it means if the other issues get anything wrong, get anything else wrong, or red, things are not going on well for you. So this task was a classical task whereby you needed to understand the scope of your task, of your work, isn't it? What was I supposed to do with? And the I ought to get you the specific scope. Yeah. Then another learning point of this task was you will find that because the, the five step model is a bit chronological, all the requirements are connected with an end. Is that so? Yes. Say identify a contract, there's no contract, there's no point in going to step two. But so there's no contract. If there are no performance obligations, should I go to the next stage? There's no point in it. So, what was the learning point from this task? Your discussion had to be consistent, isn't it? On performance obligation, you conclude that you have got one performance obligation. And when you go to allocation of transaction price, you then start to do some funny calculations. It's not a consistent, isn't it? You said you've got one performance obligation. So I don't expect any headaches around allocation of the transaction price. Since you've got a single performance obligation. So it means there's a learning point when you then do your future task. If you get a task where your things need to flow consistently, you need to make sure that you, you do so. Because otherwise, again, you may start to move in the, in the wrong direction. Task E, the ECL person. So on task E, context was very important. And task E and F confirmed they came through the same emo or in the same document. So task E and F, the importance of that was were you able to identify the distinct tasks? And task E also had the scoping issue. Task E said, or oh, within that same document, that's why we told that they already received an ECL calculation in that document. But for the purpose of task E, you are specifically told, we are only going to give the auditors the ECL report at a later stage. Therefore, when you are answering task E, it was within the context of the fact that you had not yet given the order the ECO was computational. But some of us missed that is copying. We then went to town coming up with questions around the ECO calculations. <coughs> Which was not relevant given the scoping that we had been, we had been given. And another item that came through this task is where almost all auditing tasks that you always need to keep in mind. Always ask yourself, at what stage of the auditing process are we in? Are we at planning stage? Are we at the reporting stage, concluding and reporting? Or are we, at, are we still at pre-engagement stage? Well, that context will allow you to know which issues are you going to be dealing with. 
Otherwise, you may just end up jamming the gun to say you're still at planning and they're already talking about the statement. Then yeah, planning our one is still just around risk assessment and how we're going to respond to those to those risks. Task F, if it's nine, highly technical, new term, raw rate approach. So I think what made task F worse was that if it's nine, which already is a problem for most of us, or for some of my fellow non-finite people. Then on top of that, we bring a raw rate approach. Control that made things worse. After bringing the raw rate approach, we then ask you to review. So I think problem. And when you look at the ECO reports, to some of us it looked perfect, isn't it? Just say, wow, we can't like to produce this work like this. Maybe there will be an HC candidate. So if this nine requires this task, it really requires someone with a strong technical background on this standard. But I also believe it was triggered in the PRI. So the question is, did we do enough during the pre-release period in preparing for this for this task? So this you're reflecting. Because maybe chances are high in November APC. You may get another trigger around an area that you're not really strong on it. So the quality of your work during the previous period is really going to matter in setting you up properly for whatever task then that can then come through. Then last the task G and Z. So G, I'm sure the interesting thing about G, it was not your usual ethics question in terms of how it was structured. The one that we had come used to, where, where you are asked to discuss the ethical dilemma, isn't it? Here you are now asked to develop a code of conduct. <coughs> or to be a prepared code of conduct. Again, for most of us, the code looks right. looks so bad. Or we just felt we needed to say something was bad about this code. Now, after the classical one, which I discussed with you, so that's because of the week before. When you're talking about that, integrity and honesty should not be should not be separated, <coughs> it should be lumped up together, therefore the code needs to be revised, ETC. So looking at task F and G, I think for most of us what we need to work on is our review skills. How do you review someone's work? Because we really felt that some of us just struggled with the concept of reviewing. How do you review? And in what circumstances the review expects you to only focus on the negatives? Under what circumstances the review expects you to focus on everything, the good and the, and the bad and the. Then lastly, Jelkin said, So this was a strategy question, emanating from the trigger and the PRI. So like I said before, if all of us had done some work on researching on the judge and but one question that we did the answer in the previous ones, why were we even worried about generation one? He said, if you had answered that question, task H, would be manageable for you. Well, the story question then said, okay, can you tell us how we can respond to the needs of this generation as part of remodeling our, our business? So my parting words on the task edge. Greenfield area, I believe all of us, or most of us, don't have a prior working knowledge on a, ta on a task like this, how do I respond to a specific customer segment? And who is that customer segment? In another interesting dilemma, do you think the generation Z in Zimbabwe is the same or has got the same profile as the generation Z in China or the United States? Do you think about the, they were the same profile? There are going to be variations. 
because of the different contexts in the two or in the countries. So when you are doing your research, were you able to capture this? Because well, most likely most of the documentation you are reading, they, what were the sources? The documents in developed countries. But you never then reflect and say, but in Zimbabwe, what is the profile of my genes that you know as in Zimbabwe? So that contextualization is always what's important when you do your, your research. So guys, this is it for me just to on the reflection on assessment too. And one thing that I really want to emphasize whilst Mike is coming through to take the next session is please let's learn from what you've done so far. Don't worry that you got an AOC in an assessment, you got a BC or you're even assessed as highly competent. Ask yourself what I learned from that process. If I got an XC, what should I continue doing in it as I move forward? If I got an LC, what should I stop doing it? <coughs> and what do I need to work on? So that at least you can take the full benefits of participating in, in this program. So before I ask Mike to come through any questions or contributions. None. Okay, so I'll ask the Prof. Mike to come through and take you through. Well, thanks, Elliot. That is very unique. you need to do so. Uh, I think also um, they tend to ask for payment at the same time, but if you're unable to pay, I'd say get registered first and sort out the payment while to get the registration in. So otherwise, what's going to happen is you're going to miss the bus, and the next time the bus comes round is November 2020. Okay, so you don't want to be waiting there on the, uh, on the at the station for that. Okay. The other thing that's uh, quite important is that as you go through case studies, there's always an inclination to kind of think about the technical stuff that you've missed and to go back and to work on that and think about it and get your technical knowledge to be better. But you've got to remember that, you know, for argument's sake, in this particular assessment, there was leasing versus borrow to purchase. What are the chances of that coming up in another case? Very, very low. So what's important here is if you battled with that particular task, you've got to think very carefully about how you manage to get into that situation where you're underprepared. So it's the process that you need to reflect on and think of. And, and, and be very critical about that. So one of the questions I like to ask is, how many candidates here, when they've written assessments this year, have found that the eight hours was sufficient for what they wanted to do? Or would you have liked a little more time? OK. So one of the things is, you're not alone. I have yet to meet a candidate who said, I didn't need eight hours to do that assessment. I could have done it in seven. And so what I was doing is just fiddling around at the end. So even the really good candidates who are getting HC need their eight hours. Then there are other candidates who have, would, would have ideally liked to probably have nine or 10 hours. And that's just not available. And so when you think about that, there are two aspects to it. The first aspect, it probably indicates, if you're running out of time badly, that you're not doing enough work in the pre-release period. You're not taking these issues far enough. As Elliot said, we will come across new terminology. Generation Z comes through. So we go out and Google it, we find out about it, but we don't think about what the implications of Generation Z are for a logistics company. That means that we're not doing enough work in the pre-release period. If we're not doing enough work or effective work in the pre-release period, we've got to ask ourselves, are our groups effective? Because some of the stuff 
we can miss on our own, but when we discuss it within a group, we should be getting guidance and people should be pointing out, but don't we need to do this or don't we need to do that? And then you won't miss it. So as Elliot pointed out very strongly, you can't have some of the group doing some work and the rest of the group doing other work and then swapping the work. That doesn't work because you don't have a deep understanding. But what is critical is that you make sure that you're doing the right work in the right way. Okay. And that's where the groups are very, very helpful. And you've got to reflect then on also your time management on the day. And one of the things that's been quite interesting is as I've gone around and done a number of groups this week, we've had, with smaller groups, active discussions from candidates on time management within the eight hours. And different people have different styles. But what they've been doing is they've been thinking about it carefully and then making odd changes and then working it through. So if you still find that having written assessment two or maybe the supplementary assessment as well, that you have a time crisis on your hands, you need to think about that planning. And remember this part of the APT program is really about getting you up to speed for the APC. So you demonstrated that you're able to demonstrate professional competence. You've done that in our assessment. But we've got to keep you going up until the 20th of November. Many of you will have run a long distance race at some stage. And you will have known that an enormous amount of pain and time goes into the training for such a race. Okay. And if we got to a situation where we suddenly achieved our target in terms of fitness and in terms of our time that we wanted to achieve in a particular race and we now had three weeks to go to the race, we wouldn't sit back and do nothing between them and the race. So what we've got to do is even if you've demonstrated competence so far, you've got to keep working, reflecting, thinking about it. You don't want to change things too drastically but you should be fine-tuning stuff all the way through. So it's thinking about the groups, thinking about what happens in that pre-release period. You've also got to think about your file. Your file is the product of the work that you do in the pre-release period. And as I talk to candidates and I ask them to what extent did they use their file in the assessment, I get a wide variation of responses. Some of them look at me and say, I didn't use my file at all, or very briefly, but I didn't feel that I needed to because I remembered everything that's in my file. That's the good candidate. That's what should be happening. Remember we talked about as you work through things to test your understanding you must do a half or one page summary of the particular concept that you've been dealing with. So you've got Generation Z, you then write a half a page on what Generation Z is, what are the aspects that are demonstrated there, and then how does that affect a logistics company. Once you've done that summary, and you're basically going in and dealing with the information on the day, you won't need to go back to your file to look at that because in putting that summary together you will have crystallized your thoughts around it. So you'll be able to respond very quickly to a task that's related to that. If you never do that one page summary and you just go in there with some loose ideas about what Generation Z is, then effectively what you're trying to do is that one page summary on the day of the assessment. And you're going to, at the very least, run out of time. But probably more than that, you're not going to do it justice. So again, it's taking what we're doing in the pre-release period a little bit further to make sure that we properly prepare 
for what happens on the day. I think also there is some confusion about how or what the dominant players are on the day in terms of the information that you're responding to. And make no mistake, the information on the day basically is more key to dealing with your tasks than the pre-release. The pre-release is important and it gives us context. But the terms of reference in terms of the task that we have been given arrive in the information on the day. And so we've got to look at that very, very carefully. We don't want to forget the stuff that we've done in the pre-release period, but if we've done it properly and we've done our one-page summaries, it's sitting up here. We don't need to go to our file to have a look at it. And then we can immediately apply that to solving the problem and making sure, as Elliot has pointed out, that most of these tasks have different elements that have to be spoken to. And we've got to make sure that we deal with each and every one of them. And we will know from our grading guides that what we look for is coverage and then we talk about depth. And the depth is the ability to take that coverage and apply it in the context of that particular company to solve the problem that's been raised. But the point that Elliot made, which I think is very, very important that you need to take out of today's meeting, is that if you don't have the coverage, you can't have the depth. So right at the beginning, in terms of planning your response, you've got to make sure that you've picked up all the issues. Because if you don't pick up all the issues, then the depth disappears. So your coverage is a priority. But you need the depth as well. So that's, you don't have to have all the depth, but if you don't have half the coverage, as has been said, you're not going to be competent. You're borderline competent at best. So these are just things that we need to think about. We should have learned from our previous assessments, the feedback that we get. And of course, the big risk of us using our files too much is that we get a grade that comes back, and the grade or the marker says, theory done. OK, we've all seen that, right? We've all been exposed to that. Well, how has that happened? It's happened because we haven't prepared properly in the pre-release period. What we have done is we've put stuff into our file, and then when we've got to a task that touches on that particular issue, we then just go and regurgitate, basically, the theory around it without thinking our way through. Okay. So those are some just important things that we need to think about. Um, in terms of reflecting on what is happening. And of course, we're asking you to deal with uh, another case study now, uh, Metagog. And this is the case study that was used for the 2017 APC. All right. So just going through this, this high level introduction, taking those points, just how do we go about doing this stuff? So we're going to put a little bit more guidance into it. And remember that in terms of what should you be doing between now and the 20th of November, we put out every week a program as to how to keep your fitness going, your competency fitness going. So if you follow that program and you do that work and you've been able to demonstrate competence at this point, you should be just fine. All right, so firstly, what we've got to do is do a broad overview and contextualize. So we've got to have an understanding as to what that industry is. You've got to read through it. And that doesn't mean just reading through it once. You've got to go through it two or three times, making sure that you have an understanding as to what's going on. What are the issues? What are the problems that are coming through? And of course, what that then means is that we can start identifying those signals and triggers. For those of you who wrote the supplementary 
assessment two, you will have seen that the addendum, the additional pre-release, had a marked up version, or you got a marked up version, which had the signals and triggers there. Okay. That is not what's going to happen in the APC. Okay. So that was an error on our part. We apologize for that. Um, we don't think it's a major issue. We think that candidates are pretty good at this stage in terms of identifying signals and triggers. The big challenge is how do you take that forward? What work do you do and how do you make sure that you're properly prepared for dealing with the information on the day and the specific task that you've been given? All right, so that's all part of kind of understanding that and doing the signals. And of course, what's really important is that we're going to focus on the triggers because the triggers give us guidance as to what work and then we can think about how we're going to do that work. So then I think it's important before you go off and do anything. So if there's terminology there that you don't understand, get that together. You need to go and Google it and think about it and think how it fits in with the industry. But the next stage is then really is to have a group meeting where you start going through confirming your findings are consistent with those of the other people in your group. That's the purpose of a group. It's to get guidance on the direction to take. It's not to share the work out, it's to get guidance. That's the important thing. Contextualize mutual understanding and signal identification. So any one of us individually can end up missing a signal or a trigger. But if you've got a group of four or five people, the chances of that trigger going unidentified is zero. But the individual, it can happen. If you've got a very small group and you've only got two people in the group, there's a bit of a risk there. It's still much less than trying to do it on your own. And what you've got to do is when you go to that group meeting, you've got to be prepared. If you've done nothing, then effectively you're relying on the work of others. And that's risky. And of course, it's bad for the people who have done some work because they're not getting any input from you. So for groups to be really effective, people when they arrive at those groups need to be well informed. They need to have done some work. And they need to be outspoken about their feelings. Then you've got to go off and do the work. And we spent some time this morning talking about industry research. And of course, industry research, I think, has got two stages to it. The initial stage is going out and finding out what's happening in that particular industry. Looking at some competitor companies, seeing how they perform and some issues. But then there's a second stage to industry research, and that is when we do some of our analysis, we pick up various problems. And not only do we need to identify how to solve those problems, we need to identify how to solve those problems in the context of the particular industry. So these two things sort of go in circular reference. And as we do the industry research, we get a broad understanding, then we do some analysis, we see some things that are problems, issues, inconsistencies, and we've got to work back into industry analysis and say, okay, in this particular area, what's happening now? We have said from the beginning of the program that the APC is not a test of technical competence, it's a test of professional competence. And I think sometimes people think that that means that the technical stuff is not important. But that's not the case because you can't demonstrate professional competence if you're not technically competent. So that technical, when you look through all the frameworks and everything that we talk about, right throughout the program, what you will see is that the base for every task is a technical foundation. 
And if you don't have that technical foundation, then it's quite difficult to build a proper solution to the problem on top of that. So just be mindful of that. And of course, you don't have to go in there having all the knowledge that you had for the ITC. But where technical things have been triggered, your level of knowledge should be equivalent in those areas to what it would have been if you were writing the ITC. So we're going to focus, because of the pre-release, on a few technical issues. But when we go in, we need to be hotshot. <coughs> um, then we've got to think about indirect triggers. Where do those indirect triggers come from? Well, again, it's linked to this kind of as we do analysis and we think about what's in the pre-release and we try and understand what this company is about. So we pick up additional problems, things that weren't evident right at the beginning. And we then got to feed that back in all in the pre-release period. And some overall themes. So one of the overall themes that's always in a case study is a broad strategic approach, thinking about the strategy. How does that strategy kind of fit in with the norms of the industry? How diversified is the company in terms of the product range that it produces or services? Those sort of things are part of these overall themes. And we do need to think about them a bit and discuss them in our groups because different people will have different perspectives and from that becomes comes a, a richness that's going to help us. And then the strategic considerations kind of link back to these issues over here. <coughs> All right. And then one of the things that we developed during the course of the program is this concept of having a deep understanding. And the way the deep understanding works is we start off by saying we've got to understand the basic principles. Those are the technical foundations. We've got to be able to apply those to the problem in the context of the particular case that we're dealing with. And then what we've got to be able to do is say, well, how is that? Just think about you know, what sort of things we could be asked to do on the day. We don't try and anticipate what we're going to be asked because there are just so many variations of tasks around that it's impossible to really anticipate. But you're thinking of the different types of things that you could be asked to do and say, do I have a solid enough background to deal with that should it come along? And that's really just a test in terms of the adequacy of your preparation. And of course, the group work, there's guidance there, and of course, you know, many minds will have a much better response to a problem than a single mind. Okay. So, when you reflect on this, focus on the quality and the understanding of the work done. And if you feel that historically when you've done other assessments, you know, the people who have really performed well on that <coughs> program were ones who I'm talking to a group uh, just on Monday, where a number of them really struggled with assessment well. They did appallingly. But then as a group, they got together and said, we've got to fix this thing. And so they thought about taking different approaches and all the rest, and they went through. And when assessment two came along, it was amazing. There was a huge improvement because they had kind of reflected on it and built upon it. So we, it's not the, the detail, the content, which is important, but thinking about how we make sure that you know, we're not caught short going forward. And so these are these things here. This takes, picks up from the previous slide, you know, the deep understanding, applying it to do the context. If we don't understand the context, we don't understand the problem that has been articulated relative to that particular company, then it becomes almost impossible to do the application. So we need to have that, but we also have to understand those basic principles. That's the technical stuff. 
And then we anticipate basically what could happen to see whether we've done enough. Because remember, in the pre-release period, we've got this opportunity to discuss and talk to our peers. We've got the opportunity to go out and do some work. We've got the opportunity to do some research, analysis, whatever. But suddenly, when we come to the day, we can carry on. We can't do the research because we're kind of locked out. But we can do the analysis and the other stuff on the day, except for the fact that you don't have time. Okay. So you can't leave stuff to the day. If you've got analysis that you can do now, do it now. Don't defer it. Because when you get to the day, um, it's, it's not going to work. Remember that we have been told by the institutes that if a candidate chooses to only do six tasks instead of eight, they're going to be not competent. So if you just, or even if you do seven out of eight, you're probably going to be not competent. Okay. So one of the golden rules is you've got to manage your time and make sure you can make a reasonable contribution on all eight of those tasks. So this is not new stuff. What we're trying to do now is, you having had the experience, we're hoping now that you can sit back and with that experience, reflect on it and see it more holistically than you would have done early on in the program. When new concepts come together, it's often very difficult to see them holistically. So now what we're hoping is that you stand back and like an artist, you can stand back and see the picture as a whole rather than the individual little components that are going in. All right. But it is important to carry on. And of course, that means you're here for class nine already. Um, and class 10 uh, as well is very important in terms of looking at that but also reflecting on these other case studies, reflecting on your assessment one and assessment two, and areas where even if you've done well, how could I have done better? Would I have done better if I'd managed my time more effectively? Of course, we all would. But then the question is, how do I manage my time more effectively? Need to think about that. All right, on the day of the assessment, read the requirement first and get a broad understanding. When we talk about the requirement then, that's the list of tasks. Uh, you, will have, you will know from the experience that you've seen at looking at case studies that typically when you look at those tasks, they refer to documents in the information on the day. So to that extent, reading through, I mean, apart from identifying that the eight tasks, broadly, you, you need to look at that in the context of the information on the day at the same time to get a sense of what's about. Read the information on the day, and again, what we're doing is putting the things together. You may well find, so one of the things I think often happens is candidates have an impression that there'll be one task that is on ethical issues. And that's fine, that's right. But then they forget that other tasks are interdisciplinary, and so you can have an ethical consideration elsewhere as well. It's not as though any one task is looking at it. So just be mindful of that as you're putting the stuff together. So if you're looking at a document and you see the example that was given here was taking an agreement and basically just changing the date on it to backdate it, and that sort of slips into some other task. You've got to say, hey, wait a moment. Is that ethical? Is that appropriate? All right. So that's part of pulling it together. And then the connecting the information on the day to that of the pre-release. But remember the pre-release is very high level. So really, the way that we do that connection is by thinking about the work that we did, which is sitting in our working papers or our file, 
which is really a summary of what we found in that pre-release paper. And so it's not as though you've got to have the pre-release document there and you necessarily track the things across. As you go through, you'll pick that up almost automatically if you've got some deep thinking and you've gone through and worked rigorously with that pre-release document in the pre-release period. You've got to map the information on the day to the tasks. The question that I always get is, firstly, do I need to read all the information on the day before I start tackling any task? What do you think the answer is? Few nods? Absolutely, you do. Because information, remember what we're saying up here, is information be, can be scattered around on the information on the day. So you might find relevant bits of information in other documents. It's not as a, you know, document X goes with task A. And that's all we have to worry about. It's much more integrated than that. So you've got to go through, and certainly you've got to think about that very, very carefully. The other question I get frequently is, should I ask, answer the tasks starting with A and finishing up with H or whatever it is, or should I do them? My personal preference would be the latter. Start off with the stuff that you're familiar with, that you think you're going to be quick at, and go, because psychologically, one of the things that I always got out of an assessment when I did it, was I think, well, I've done that, and I've done a pretty good job, I think, so that's a banker. And then that took some of the pressure off me when I was dealing with tasks that I was less confident with. Thank you. Yeah, question. I have a question. Um, so you said that there are some documents that are interlinked in the answer of the task. So then, like, from our tasks that we've been given, they usually say that go to um, respond to the email sent in document H. Yes. So now, I'm trying to understand now how do I now deal with interrelated things now when it's told me about document H. Yes. Okay, that's a good question because it can be confusing. So, so thank you for that. So what you're looking for is when they say in, in, in task A, uh, as, as you know, respond to the requirement as mentioned in the email which is shown in document E. What that document E does is it gives you the terms of reference in terms of what you need to do as a task. That's in its parameter. But you will still be influenced by contextual things that are sitting out there. So if you've got something that's happening in that task which is completely inconsistent with something that's happening elsewhere, you need to pick it up. Let me give you an example. Farm fresh chickens. Remember it. Okay. So there there was a transfer pricing task. Okay. So sitting in that particular document, there were a number of documents, emails going backwards and forwards, and there's a tussle over the pricing of the feed. And one of the things that the manager of the broiler division wanted to do was to say, I'm going to outsource my feed supply because I can get it cheaper. Elsewhere in Farm Fresh Chickens, we saw a very strong indication that the strategy of the group was to insource, not outsource. Okay. It's not mentioned in any of those emails what the strategy is. But if you're giving a good answer, you've got to say, apart from all the transfer pricing issues, we have an inconsistency here. We have a strategy for the group, which is to insource. And now we have one rogue manager who says, I'm not going to be part of that. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to outsource my feed. And then linked to that probably, if you really want to be a good candidate, you've got to ask yourself, was that an appropriate strategy? What did the competition do? And in fact, if you did take it a bit further, and you looked at what happened with the competition, you would see that the competition tended to outsource. 
So then maybe the problem is with the strategy and not with the manager of the Broiler Farm Division. Okay. So these are things that they weren't directly part of the transfer pricing problem, but they're part of the context. Okay. You don't have to pick them all up. So remember, and we'll have to look at a couple of examples now, what do you need to be competent? Well, you've got to pick up what they refer to as kind of most of the issues, but certainly not all. All the institutes and APT recognize that what you're doing is effectively the first draft of a response to a particular task. It would be the first draft. There's been no review that's taken place, so one wouldn't expect it to be perfect. If it is, that's brilliant. But we certainly wouldn't expect it to be perfect. But as Elliot mentioned early on, there is a bottom limit as well. You would want it to be substantively there. So if a whole load of stuff is missing, and the person who's requested that particular task is in a situation where they have to say, I don't think I can do anything with this response, I'll start again, that's clearly a not competent. So it's got to be substantively there. It might not be polished and finished, but the main issues need to be picked up. All right. How do we allocate time to the different tasks? And I think different people that I've spoken to have done it in different ways. But the one thing in common is that every person who has been able to manage time, they've been under pressure, but they've been able to manage time and do all their tasks, they have always allowed for some slack in terms of allocation right at the beginning. So typically what candidates who are doing well are telling me, the way they deal with it is to take some time out of the equation. So the example that I had, which sounds quite, quite uh, plausible and useful, was a candidate who put one hour into planning the responses for the various tasks right at the beginning. Just basically drawing up those expectation tables in terms of the broad frameworks that needed to be covered. They would then look at the tasks, and instead of trying to put time on them, they classified them as short, medium, and long, to get a sense as to they also then had an hour slack in terms of the allocation. So they had really six hours to do each task, which would give you a mean time of 45 minutes of task. But by playing around, they pulled some of those down by 10 minutes and they pushed others up by 10 minutes, depending on whether they were short, medium, or long. So a medium would have been 45, and a short would have been 35, and the other. And they said that that kind of worked for them. Now, we all have our own way of dealing with these things, but that's a sensible way of approaching it. And you do need to have some slack, because inevitably, somewhere along the line, something's going to take you a little longer than you thought. And of course, apart from the fact that you're under time pressure, you know, psychologically, if you become under pressure, you're far more likely to do silly things going forward. So that's quite critical. And then what happens is we go off and we basically do the analysis when we talk about the work. So you will be required to do analysis on the day. There's no doubt about that. That's very much, you know, there's the, the assessment is not about asking you to reproduce analysis that was done in the pre-release period. That analysis will inform you, will give you context that you did in the pre-release period but you're going to have to do new analysis on the day. So you're going to have to do that work and basically then respond to those tasks. All right. So this is the individual task information on the day. So again, putting all this stuff together, we've spoken a lot about this. Uh, we need to read the requirement very carefully uh, from the task linked to the specific terms of reference, which will be sitting in the information on the day. And then 
think about the embedded tasks in terms of the pre-release and the information on the day. So one of the things like for argument's sake in that leasing uh, question that came through um, with your assessment two, so we basically you had to do an analysis, you had to calculate some numbers and whatever, but more than that, you had to explain to Richard, who was an on CA, basically what you were doing, how you were doing it, and why you were doing it. Okay. So if somebody just went and did the calculations there and didn't bother with any of the explanation, Richard would be a bit miffed. Okay. So that's the sort of thing that we need to think about. Okay. And this framework that we've got here is what we see in every expectation table. Sitting at the top, what are the technical issues that we need to pick up on? What is the context? What is the problem? Who is the audience? What's the significance of that? The significance of that is that it tells us whether it's formal or informal the response. So emails tend to be informal, whereas a report for the board would be a formal, or a letter to the JSC would be formal. So it gives us some sense around that, but also whether the audience is predominantly chartered accountants or not. And so if, it's, if they're predominantly not chartered accountants, we need to explain why we do what we're doing in terms of IFRS or whatever else we deal with. Whereas when we talk one accountant to the other, we tend to make reference to various parts of IFRS and we have a common understanding and we have a common belief that that's our Bible. That's how we kind of do our business. But when you start talking to an engineer or a marketing person, they don't have IFRS as their Bible. You know, so, so then you've got to explain why we do what we do. Uh, do the additional work re required, okay? So, you know, the pre-release is always giving you context. But the information on the day gives you the specific terms of reference. So, in terms of emphasis, you're going to be putting more emphasis on the information on the day and less on the pre-release. And I still often talk about a sort of 70-30 or an 80-20, sort of in favor of the information on the day. Then you answer the task, and we've been speaking quite a bit about time. That includes me. All right. So the role, uh, you'll see that uh, through the various case studies that you've dealt with, that there are a number of different roles. And, uh, and I think at the end of the day, it makes some difference to the way that you respond. Um, so it does give some context. But it's not a huge uh, influencer in terms of the way that we deal with the task. So what's important here is that we have our technical foundation, that we have basically a good understanding of the problem, we understand the context, and we're thinking about, when we talk about the audience, why have we been asked to do this? If we don't understand why we've been asked to do something, the chances are we're not going to give them what they're looking for. So we need to understand, that's the audience. Why are they asking us to do this? What's their purpose? All right. Um, we've spoken to that already, so I'm not going to go through that again, but just things thinking about. Um, Planning individual tasks, so once we've gone through and thought about holistically what we've got to do, we then get into the specifics, and, um, and here you see we're fleshing this out. That again is our expectation table. So these are the technical issues we need to pick up on. Down here is the context, what are the problems, and then the audience, the form of the communication, the length, professional tone. One of the issues that's come through, I had somebody who was uh, very anxious on Monday who came to speak to me to say that in assessment two, one of the tasks asked for a one-page email uh, as a response. 
And, um, and when he did it using the software, Exam Secure, he, um, well, Secure Exam, I think, is the software. Once he used it, he basically had this email which was one page, and then he was very, very distressed to see that basically once it had gone through and been encrypted, that the version that we got, his email ended up in one and a half pages. And I had to explain to him that we're not that, it's not as though we're going to just mark, you know, look at the first page and not look at the second page. That one page is a guideline. Uh, if you write 10 pages, that will have a negative impact on your response. And it will also stuff up your time. So you don't want to do that. But you know, one page or two pages, it's, you don't need to stress. And that software, we are aware of the fact that often what you're seeing on your screen, once it becomes encrypted, uh, the format changes a little bit. Um, there were some candidates who really struggled to do PowerPoint presentations. And my answer to that is, just have broad headings saying slide one, this is the headings that you'd have in that slide, slide one, speaker notes down below, slide two, headings, slide two, speaker notes down below. So if you're trying to do it in a little box and things like that, um, they were having some problem with that. And the test of professional competence is not about formatting your response, it's about the content. Okay. So don't get too hung up with that. So some of the things that have come through previously, um, spending too much time on admin or too much time on traveling. You know, if you're going to have meetings, in the pre-release period, your group's going to meet, and it's, you really do need to do that. I think you need to have probably three meetings um, where you have, and, the, and the, the first one will be a long one. That's where you go through identifying the signals and triggers, identifying what work needs to be done and how it should be done. Then people go off and do their own thing. Then you need to have a report back, <coughs> some sort of feedback on that, where you identify certain gaps and you further refine it. You also will pick up, uh, for argument's sake, um, some other uh, triggers that come, up, that come as a result of the analysis that you've done. So you have a quick chat about that, but that'll be a shorter meeting, and then what you do is on day five, you have a quick wrap-up meeting, just to kind of put it all to, 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 together at the end. And those, uh, the, the second and the third meeting shouldn't really go on for more than Second meeting, probably an hour and a half. It's a 90-minute meeting. The third, the third meeting should be not more than 60 minutes. And then the first meeting, you might end up spending about three hours of it, if you're doing it properly. So that's what you want to do, is you want to make that as effective as possible. Okay. Again, those meetings will be much shorter if you haven't prepared properly. Okay. Because if you go there and you're not prepared, there's not much to talk about. So, so it's, uh, and then well, the, it worse still, we end up talking about other things. Okay. So that's then a waste of time. So, so we don't want to get distracted, we want to go there, and these meetings need to be productive, energy driven. Okay. Alright. The file we've spoken about, you know, in terms of those one page summary, we may well have technical stuff in there, there may be specific <laughs> points of reference, that we want to go and check on, and that's all well and good. But for the vast majority of stuff, it's sitting in our head. So the file, putting it together, is just a process that we've been through where we've really crystallized these thoughts. Um, all right, uh, didn't I identify basically all the embedded tasks, didn't manage time well. Again, uh, the embedded tasks is here you're on your own. So now you've got to basically, as part of the experience you're going through that pre-release and what you've done on the program, you should be looking at the problem holistically. So what are the other issues that need to be thought around here? You know, so, um, uh, and then not answering what is asked on the day. So that often is just because people feel, uh, and they don't really, feel comfortable that they know what's been asked, so then what they do is they go and they tend to pull something out of their file and sort of hope that it's vaguely relevant and that it might help them in some way. 
So it's important to kind of think very carefully before setting off. Before you do that expectation table, you crystallize your thoughts as to exactly what's the problem here and how we're going to solve it. All right, pre-release. So there's some problems there. Uh, we've touched on those. Information on the day, I think we've also touched on all of that. Um, and it's the context here. So you know, a theory dump means that you're not paying any attention whatsoever to context. So where there's zero context, that's when you're getting this comment of it's a theory dump. The stuff that you say might be relevant, but there's no context to it. So and it doesn't solve the problem. All right, so some tasks here, just going through, uh, making sure that you fully address all aspects. So picking up the four issues, or the three issues. Remember, if we don't have coverage, we cannot have depth. So we've got to identify the area first before we can have depth. Uh, didn't understand the context, okay? So there's context on the day as well. Often when the details of these problems are put into documents which we get on the day of the assessment, sitting in there is some context, some definition as to what the problem is. But there's also context that comes from the work that we did in the pre-release period. Didn't understand the audience? That's not really a problem. You know, early on when the program first started running, there were sometimes, you know, so for argument's sake, you might be asked by the CFO to do something, and that's a report for the board. What you've got to remember, the audience is not the CFO. The audience is the board, because that's ultimately where the report is going. Likewise, if the CFO asks you to do a letter in response to a query from the JSC monitoring panel, then effectively the audience is the JSC not the CFO. So, but, you know, that audience isn't really an issue when we look at, at candidates' responses. Uh, understand the role that has some impact um, and the way that you respond. And typically, the major differential is whether you're working for the company or you're working outside the company as a consultant. That does make a little bit of a difference in terms of the way that you respond. So if you, for argument's sake, the audit senior on that particular audit, that role is a bit different to being the assistant to the CFO. And of course with Metagog, we were working for a, a firm of management consultants, and uh, basically they were doing work for Metagog um, in that particular test. And you see this time coming through time and time again. So that's something that you need to reflect on. Okay. And I, I don't know how pressurized you were on these days when you've done these assessments, but you need to reflect on that and think about it carefully. All right, just some terminology. Uh, quite often, we're given something to review. And uh, Elliot mentioned that earlier on. And I would say, obviously, what you've got to go through is to try and think about both the things that are right and the things that are wrong. So it's always useful to start off saying, you know, I agree with this, that, and the other, but then I think there are some shortcomings. It just kind of changes the tone of it. So you don't want to spend a lot of time on the sort of commendations, but then you would have recommendations that would follow in terms of improvement. So that would be your tactful tone professionalism coming through here. And, um, and then we see in last year's APC 2018 uh, tasks, uh, case study 4, E and F were both to critically review. With Medagog, which is 2017, they did the same thing. They gave a goodwill calculation and they asked for comments on how appropriate it was. Assess and recommend. When you assess something, you have to do a full-blown analysis, and then you're making a recommendation in terms of the way forward. Okay. 
justify and defend. So that typically kind of links to financial reporting stuff, where we've used a particular accounting policy, or we've chosen a style of disclosure, and so what we have to do is justify and defend. And then ethics task, uh, just remember, don't kind of be overzealous. Start thinking that everything that is slightly un unsavory is unethical. So for argument's sake, a candidate came to me and said that uh, in the supplementary assessment too, there was some talk of um, then moving from being very labor intensive to more capital intensive. And one of the issues that would happen there is as a result of the restructuring, there would be some unemployment created. And she said that's highly unethical. It's highly undesirable, but it's not unethical. Thank you. So, um, so there are all sorts of things. So there are reputational risk. We have a responsibility to society generally and all those sort of things. So that's what's up. But it's not necessarily unethical. So we mustn't just kind of, you know, and of course if we follow labor law and we go through and notify the unions and the workers in terms of basically what's proposed and they are given a chance to respond and deal with that, then effectively it's legal and ethical. And it's just a fact of life that, you know, um, that it may well be that going forward, more and more functions will be produced by capital rather than labor. <coughs> All right. Characteristics of a good response. So you can just run through those. But understanding the task is the critical thing. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, if you really understand the task and you understand the context, then the rest of the stuff becomes quite easy. But if we get this wrong, then it's very difficult to fix the rest. Um, talking about, we've spoken about depth and coverage, tone appropriate, include, don't go and dump a whole load of industry research unless it's core to the issue that you're dealing with. So again, if you had some stuff that you'd done or you'd seen a research report and you started quoting large chunks of that, it's going to take up your time and unless it's absolutely pertinent to the specific issue being discussed, you're not going to benefit from that and you're going to lose time. Right, and then uh, proper planning. You've seen this slide many times before in other classes. But in effect, what we're saying is there are those fundamentals, those technical fundamentals at the bottom there. Yeah? Um, yes, um, if I may ask, um, how do you assess coverage when you come to calculation? Coverage on calculation? On calculation of 10%. Okay, so, so let's go. Uh, the question is, how do we do about coverage? So if, uh, if you were to look, the easiest one that's familiar is that leasing. Lease versus borrow to purchase. Some calculations there, so you do an Excel. Uh, when you look at the expectation table, it says that basically most of the cash flows are identified. Okay? So that would be most is more than half. And then the other thing is that you haven't put in things like depreciation or totally irrelevant cash flows that have nothing to do with the lease versus borrow to purchase. So that would be kind of how we would talk about the, the coverage there. And then, um, and then the depth, really, of that question comes through the, the argument that we're making for doing the analysis that we do. That shows our understanding and our ability to apply it to these Honda behind uh, H1 buckets. <coughs> Does that help you? You're looking, you're looking a bit dubious. Huh? <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah, we're running seriously out of time. All right. And then this is very important here. Yeah? But I just, there's one thing on this slide 
where I'm not quite on the same page as my colleagues. And my, my thinking here is that if you want to pass the APC, and let's face it, we all want to get through the APC, I would say that what you're trying to aim initially is to have no LCs. Because if you have no LCs, the chances are you're going to be competent overall. Because those BCs, if they're pretty solid, will probably get moved up and you will always have some tasks where you end up with an Alright. So what you want to do is you want to manage risk from the bottom up. I'm a finance guy. So that's how we've always done it. We've always, it's the, the low hanging fruit that you want to manage. And here is the situation where if you go and you aim too high on a particular task, and shoot the lights out, you might get your HC, but then if you mess up a whole lot of other tasks, it's a complete waste of effort. It's all about balance. So I would I'd say scratch that out and say absolutely no LCs, exclamation point. That's what you're aiming to. That's a strategy to maximize your performance on the 20th of November. And that's why time management is also important because if you have, and you've got 10 minutes to do it, you're not going to pay justice to it. You can't do that in 10 minutes. And then you're going to have something which looks like either a not attempt or it's an attempt but so poor that it's a not competent, it's a limited competent. Right, and here we are planning around these things again. See the format of this? Looks just like an expectation table. And we've seen expectation tables for each and every case study that we've dealt with since right at the beginning. All right, do's and don'ts on the day of the APC. Don't identify yourself in responses. Don't use your real name. Believe it or not, every year there are a couple of people who forget that and identify themselves. And it makes life difficult, so please don't do it. Uh, no need to perform research on different industries. Okay, So you're not going to try and think about kind of doing industry research on the day. You just don't have time. What you've done, you've done, and you've got to use that to the best of your advantage. Carry on with the approach that you've developed over the program. It doesn't make sense if you've been training in a particular way and you suddenly get to a couple of weeks before the race. You don't want to suddenly change your training regime. It's going to make a mess. So this is the same. What you're familiar with, keep doing it, but reflect on it and refine it. Reflect and refine, reflect and refine. But just a little bit at a time. Don't leave out tasks, manage your time, and of course remember to bring your file, and most importantly, arrive at the venues with your laptop fully charged. So all the venues will have power in them, but it's important that when you start off, that you're starting off with a, um, a full battery in your laptop, and of course, if power goes down and the generator needs to kick in, there may well be a little bit of a period where you're relying solely on the battery of your laptop. Also make sure that your hard disk has a little bit of space so that you can write the backup files to it. Uh, types of questions, we've spoken about that. Number of questions, we've been kind of encouraging uh, the institutes to think about maybe reducing the eight questions to seven. I'm not sure that we've been successful. <laughs> so I would think on the balance of probability, you're likely to see eight again. Our argument is that for seven tasks, you can assess competency as broadly as you can with eight tasks. You don't need eight tasks to do it. And the reality of a working day 
is that uh, people wouldn't be expected to go out and do eight quite different things all within an eight hour period. So it's an argument that we have. Um, and they see us as being academic when it suits them. All right, and then the disciplines are interdisciplinary. Um, and so we just need to remember that. All right, Medagog, I'm not going to spend too much time on Medagog, A, because we're running out of time, but B, because you haven't prepared. And all of these things, if you go in now and you start looking at the tasks and looking at the solutions and you haven't done anything, then you're not really going to develop your, your procedural skills, which is what, what it's all about. But just a little bit about it, you can go through and have a look at the industry. It was uh, an interesting industry. It's private education, and the way that they deliver their programs is online. Um, in 2017, the results were pretty good. Uh, so we think that um, there seems to be, uh, and in fact, the nature of the, the assessment, when you look at it, is not dissimilar to what you would have seen with, say, dynamic supply or whatever else. Um, so these are, that's a little bit about the background. Um, some unique things that come through in terms of the fact that the way it works is that Metagog basically runs the platform that uh, communicates with the candidates who are registered for these short courses, that the intellectual property is developed by universities. And so then what happens is they have this profit sharing which is a 50-50 of student fees. And then the idea is that Medagog covers its own costs and the universities cover their own costs. Um, so some things, some quite interesting things to think about there, and when you're doing industry research, say, that looks a bit funny. Okay? Um, you know, because who would be bearing the costs here? And would the costs be equal, etc., etc.? Uh, industry specialized and unique, um, but quite a few companies around that are in this sort of space. And of course, um, what's happened in South Africa now just very recently is they, you will see mentioned, I think in the article that's there, is the fact that Get Smarter got sold to, to you. Um, now the, the, the original founders of Get Smarter uh, set up what they call the Valenture Institute, or one of the original uh, shareholders of, and uh, that's basically doing online schooling uh, using international curriculum. So that's going to be an interesting space to watch. So there's lots of, and of course as technology improves, as the internet improves, as bandwidth improves in Africa, um, so it makes more and more sense to kind of use this technology uh, to drive education. So you need to go out and do that research, and do it properly. And then basically, initially what we were talking about is two tasks that we had here. The one is a business combination, <coughs> and really what's happening here is this is where they come up with this idea of a draft goodwill calculation, and we've got to think about how we would calculate the goodwill and do an, an evaluation on that. Um, and then the other one, um, sorry, so this is still it in terms of coverage and depth. Uh, just here, what's important at these expectation tables, notice here we don't say perfect coverage. This is Syker's expectation table. A good coverage of the errors and omissions in both what we get and consideration transfer. And that will make sense when you kind of look at the information on the day, because that's how they laid out the information. So you've got two aspects to it, and you've got to pick up on both, obviously, like all of these things. And then, um, and then we say no major flawed recommendations. So you don't want to do anything crazy. So if you do something crazy, then you kind of put your whole kind of situation in, in, in jeopardy. All right. Then the other one uh, is to do with internal controls. And you'll see as you read through the pre-release, um, there was uh, the, the, the profit share agreement coming through. 50% of 
tuition revenue, each bear their own costs. And then what happened was uh, the, uh, the, the Zim partners and the global partners started questioning how they could be share, sure that they were getting their fair share. In other words, how did they know that there was uh, no underreporting of revenues owed? And so that's basically the context of that. But I think that what you should do is now, because the last 10, we're going to wrap right through to the end of Better Golf. So I think you should just kind of do the whole thing together now. So you're going to do class 9 and 10, preparation, all together. And again, see the words here? Reasonable coverage. So we're not looking at, at, at something that's perfect. So more than half, reasonable coverage in terms of the system's description. And then here again, two components. So we're talking about the system and where the weaknesses are, the critiques or, or how it supports basically uh, what they're achieving. And then also a valid suggestion on the crisis of confidence. Those are the partners who are saying, how do we know what we're getting on? All right. And I'm going to hand you back to Elliot, and he's going to take you for the rest of the session. So, um, Elliot, you're there. Yes. Remember, one of the things that we talked about when we spoke about research in the earlier classes, we talked about industry research and doing a pestle analysis. And of course, you don't have to wait until the five-day pre-release period to do a pestle analysis. These current affairs that we're talking about here are really pestle. So here we've got some polit political issues coming through. And to be honest, you can do all of this work and get a good understanding of the stuff now, because not much is going to change between now and the 20th of November. So then what you've got to do in the pre-release period is to go back to these things and say, OK, so now what's the direct impact on this particular industry that I've been given? Right, does that make sense? Right, thank you very much for having me here. Wishing you every success in the 2019 APC. I'm sure you'll do fine. Don't stress. Thank you. So I'm going to talk on current affairs. So I think we'll cover both global current affairs as well as the local current affairs. So like Prof. Mike has said, the whole purpose is when you then get your case study, you need to be appreciative of the environmental context here. Because we are saying our businesses do not operate in, the, in isolation, but they operate within the environment they are located in. And these days, due to globalization, you will find whatever happens in the global landscape will also highly likely affect even a business operating in, in Zimbabwe. So just so the purpose of this session, or part of this, is just to highlight for you things that you need to be aware of. Isn't it? So it means you, need, you, need, you then need to go and do further reading around these items. And here we have also the way we have structured the information is we have identified specific events that are currently happening and try to do a bit of impact analysis. Isn't it? So here your impact can further develop on this. How does how do you think Brexit will affect a business operating in Zimbabwe? Or a business with this new operation may be operating within the Southern Africa region? We are now trying to understand without pressure of the five-day pre-release period. So from a global perspective, I think the biggest issues of the top of the town will be Brexit, Middle East arrest, the US and China trade war. So, for example, a couple of weeks back, when a, an incident in Saudi Arabia, where one of their oil, where their oil plant was, was bombed in there. Now, I'm sure that had an adverse effect on the global oil prices. And I remember that week, one of the reasons that was given behind, in, in, behind the increase in our fuel price was the global fuel price had gone up. There. So it means. As a country, you are also not spared from events within the global world. So maybe if I may hear from you, Brexit, what do you think? How do you think Brexit can affect 
Business is operating with power. Greg is all not at all. Yes. Well, I think um, Britain is probably looking for new business allies to compensate for the business side that will probably be cut by the next Okay? So he is saying post Brexit, the UK will need to enter into new trade agreements. At the moment, by being part of the EU, they, they were utilizing the agreement that were done at EU level. Now, outside, new trade agreements have to be, have to be registered. So that can give possible opportunities for countries like Zimbabwe, isn't it? <laughs> you don't like it? <laughs> yes. I, I agree with Moku in terms of, especially when you look at, um, if we look at Zimbabwe being an agri-based uh, economy, with most of the agricultural projects right now, I had to go through e EU standard setting first before you actually enter any EU market. country market. Now that Britain is exiting, if you're going to be an agro-based economy, you're not going to have to maybe meet those EU standards because you're going to have to now discuss between directly with Britain on the standards and they might just slightly lower them in order for them to keep getting the produce because now they're competing with the whole of the EU so it's an opportunity for a Zimbabwean company actually providing whatever fruit and veggies to the, to the UK. Okay, total agree. And one thing that I want to emphasize is that when they are analyzing the global landscape, unfortunately, you find as a country, the environment that we are living in, our economics <coughs> is currently intertwined with the politics. We are saying that we are unfortunate. Which then means that at times when you are trying to make an economic analysis, if you are not careful, you can then put in political emotions <laughs> and miss out on the economic what? analysis. So some schools of thought will tell you at the moment Zimbabwe business are not exporting to the EU or they are not exporting to, to the UK. But if you go on the ground, on the ground we are actually exporting to those markets. But if you allow yourself to be clouded by, I would say, political noise, <laughs> you may miss on the proper economic reality. Isn't it? Why? Because when they assess you, most of the time you want the economic re reality, isn't it? From the research that you did, what was the economic reality on the, on the ground? Rather than just to try to focus maybe on the political angle, which we, in the assessment we are not worried about that much. Isn't it? We want the economic angle to, to come through. So when you look at global economic conditions, yes, some people say the increase in our, in our local fuel prices has nothing to do with the, how the global fuel prices move. But that, that, that's not the case. Either. If there's an increase in global fuel prices, generally as a country are going to feel the impact. Either. And we also hope by the same token that there are decreases we also benefit from those, from those decreases. So understanding where things are going as far as the global economic conditions are, are concerned. So recently today I was seeing a report whereby the IMF is projecting that China is going to have a 5% GDP growth in 2020. What does that mean within the global landscape? So it finds Zimbabwe and those best countries. And one of the biggest consumers of natural resources is China. So if their economy is going to grow, the expectation is demand for those resources is also going to go, to, to go up with it. So that is the type of analysis you should then be able to do as you are coming across this information. So maybe the case that you get, the entity you are dealing with is within the resource sector. And you have got this context with you. There are not some other say, how do I get these HC indicators? And normally this is where they come from, isn't it? Well, you are now connecting these additional, additional dots. Then also still global, I think, when you look at the global warming issues, climate change, confirm this is an issue gaining traction at the moment. So you need to be aware, what is it? What is the talk around climate change? As a country, what is Zimbabwe's position on climate change? Does anyone know? The official government position on climate change. If you don't know, you need to find out, isn't it? 
There's part of your research. So you can understand the UN's position. But as a country, what is our position? Depending on your case study, you may need to talk about to have a point around climate change, given the nature of your of the company's business. And then link to the government position on the, on the measures. Ethics. Again, ethics is an issue which is gained traction. Ethics corruption. Now say within government circles, there's always talk around corruption. We need for the the only way for this country to move forward, and this government say we need to weed out corruption. What is it all about? So given the nature of the case that we get, maybe when applicable, we may need to talk about how corruption may negatively impact the future prospects of health of the business that they are looking at. So let's come closer home. So confirm at the moment things are quite interesting in Zimbabwe. Now, this is the way interesting to live by <laughs> Why am I saying that? For example, something that was true in July, today is no longer true. Okay? Mm -hmm. And that's why Zimbabwe is very, very interesting. So it means that as you prepare for your APC, you need to be up to date 24 7. And on this one, what we are also currently discussing with ICAS, because given the nature of our current landscape, we feel that we need to have a cut-off date. But unfortunately, for example, if yes, I can just come to do the previous period, <laughs> what do you do about it? And more than the intention of the assessment did not have that SI in mind. To the extent that the time that they distort the war, the war assessment. So we are coming in discussion with ICAS to get the cut-off date. To say maybe from a legislative perspective, we are looking at let's say which were enforced as at a given date, isn't it? And so what those dates have been communicated, please keep them in mind and then do your, your research, isn't it? Anything that then comes post will not be considered relevant for your for your ACC. Isn't it? <coughs> and I'm sure that you can be that item is being necessitated by the way things are constantly being reviewed and changed in our country at the moment. But looking at some of the topical issues, which I know at times the students have been a bit hesitant to say, should I talk about them in the case study or should I not talk about them? And one of the major ones is the current issue. So I know at the moment, just this year, we have made a lot of changes around our currency. So some of the dilemma that then come to is from a, an assessment perspective. What currency should be included in your case study? Should you include the Zimbabwe dollar? Therefore, what do I do to prior numbers? Would they be Zimbabwe dollar or should they be US dollar? Now bring this brings a whole lot of questions. So our advice on this one, if your case study gives the numbers in US dollars, Please wait with those numbers in that current. So for example, let's say you've been asked to review a forecast, which has been given in US dollars. So it means for those numbers, you can't comment around hyperinflation. Do you agree? But maybe if a case study gives you numbers in bubble dollars, you can bring into play what? Inflation considerations. Because of the current in which you have given you the information. So that flexibility is very, 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 very important. For well, the moment, okay, I don't know what's in the APC, but I want you to be ready for anything. But so there are two possible options. Okay, either your case starts going to be US dollars, or it's going to be Zimbabwe dollars. So just have that flexibility. US dollars, each of inflation may not be a big thing from a current perspective. Zimbabwe dollars, you may need to worry about the change in value of the Zimbabwe dollars. Then, we also, like I said, the issue around the, the general shortages in the market. So I know, I think I was discussing with Prof. Mike before the session. But when you look at our case studies, confirm they are prepared with a stable economy in mind. Yes. So it can then bring a big dilemma to us. 
to say, okay, we've got this Kanban which seemingly appears to be performing very well. Amidst the chaos in what? In Zimbabwe. Now, how do I reconcile with all the problems that I can see on the ground? So when I do my industry search, the competitors are complaining, volumes are going down, it is are going down. But when you look at our company, everything is on an upward trend. So how do we reconcile? I said, these are the particular issues you are going to face for your APC. How then do you reconcile? None. So what would they expect? Remember the APC, we are assessing a professional skill. So the case study, we have two types of information. There's certain information that has got no scope for debating. Agreed. There's certain information that which, for which there's no scope for debating. A classic example, if you are given historical information on the historical performance of a company, can you debate that? You can't, isn't it? So it means you take it as, as isn't it? Then if you are given more forward-looking information, on that one you can debate it by reconciling to what you are seeing on the, on the ground. Say, so guys, okay, in our focus we are projecting a 20% growth in our volumes. Then you say, but it's not reconciling with the focus of GDP growth where we're expecting a negative GDP. But with a problem. Or if we continue in this hyperinflationary, on this hyperinflationary trend, chance, chance of revenue growth, or chance of there being revenue growth, then become minimal. So in other words, what is my emphasis here? You need to identify which information you can challenge it. And which information you need to, to take as is. So generally I would say historical information you can't challenge it. Unless there's a clear misstatement ETC. Forward looking information you can challenge by the content of the current economic landscape. Which is where the issue of the SFR comes into mind. So the SFR confirms the industry research is done in what context? <laughs> South Africa, which is operating in a totally different context to what we experienced in Zimbabwe. Confirm is going to, it creates further confusion for us. You have read through the, you have read through the SFR, you compare to what you are seeing in your research. It can be all the part, isn't it? So food for thought. To what extent should you be bothering yourself with that SFR? It's food for thought, you need to decide what that the ultimate system is yours. Well, if it's adding confusion on your part, you might as well drop it in. Otherwise, you're going to get in the exam. At one point, you're writing King 4. The next, you're writing National Code. The next, you're saying JSC. The next, you're saying ZSC. <laughs> Because in your mind you saw JSC someone, you saw ZSC someone. And because of the exam pressure, these two things come, you may actually fall to realize that instead of ZSC, you have written JS, JS is.
So in such a situation, I would say number one, we take it as in here, or local as here. Do you know what happens if you take that position? You then tell yourself I should not comment on it, isn't it? Take it as far the case that he said. He said these guys in the red room, they are charging 1,200 United States dollars. And from my industry analysis, what is the average rate? They be 250 to 300. There is there's a comment. Because I know for certain when we made last year's APC, it was an additional tick to say you are commenting on the disability of the price there. Peru. But for those who took it as a local thing era, one day they kept quiet. And maybe somewhere someone tried to justify the red Peru, or already in your mind you are getting confused. So my advice, like I was say, I'm saying, where something not reconciling from what you are seeing on the ground, please comment on this. Can you agree on that? Please comment on it. Don't try then to use other that information to comment on it. You might then actually end up being cheap, being downgraded. Yeah, with that position. Okay, you want a labor and race political landscape. I'm sure these are all things that we are all familiar with, isn't it? And I believe we, when you look at the electricity issues, the guys in down, down south, they also believe that they are experiencing power cuts, isn't it? They <laughs> 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 want to say they need to come to Zimbabwe, please see what are power cuts. <laughs> but I would say, where applicable, then see how do power cuts impact business, isn't it? How will it affect our business? Where applicable? So someone can then say, okay, we've got acute power shortages coupled with fuel shortage, isn't it? Will then affect the business ability to make use of backup power? The other viable option may be solar energy. If someone say all the solar energy required is very important, isn't it? and we have got forex issues. So then, it's, it's like a vicious circle around the power issues. It? So as a business, how does how then does it affect the business that we are we are dealing with? From a labour perspective, I'm sure we are part of the labour force in Zimbabwe, and I believe you know the issues that we are worried about. And the talk of the town is what incapacitation. We are now incapacitated. So how does that affect your? Your business. Maybe the company you're looking at is the finance is opening the financial services and they are giving out loans. So if labor or with the disposable income of the labor force is being eroded, ask yourself, okay, what then does it mean to earn loan advance, if applicable, on the impact? Fraud ethics, zim competitiveness. So these are all examples. I don't want to go into. So I then want to quickly look at what's happening. Now I'm talking, I've been talking about the fourth industrial revolution. I know it's probably a number of times within our case study. Do you not know what is the fourth industrial revolution? What is it all about? Yes. From my perspective, it's the, it's the tech revolution. In other words, now, industrial revolution was about processes, industrial processes. This one's more about the technology that's being used by businesses and general public in how we live and how we do business now. Okay, so you think the industrial revolution is more about technology-based solutions, solutions to business processes. So let's say hypothetically, your APC, there's a trigger around a technology that can be used. Please don't just research on understanding the technology. Ask yourself how can it be used within the business model of the company you are looking at, isn't it? If maybe there's a trigger around blockchain, <coughs> ask yourself, so how can blockchain be used? On in which processes can we can we utilize this particular technology? 
happy days. Then I know within the profession, obvious ethics is still a big issue then. And from an ethics point of view, I know traditional, the ethical issues have been around those CAs in public practice or often auditing services, isn't it? But you find that now it has extended beyond that to say, okay, when you look at ethical consideration, no matter where does the issue start from, it starts from the preferred right? who is a CA in, in business. Then the order only comes after it. So when you are reading around ethics, don't forget about the CA in what? In business. To say, what about the ethical dilemma those CAs are encountering on a day to day basis? Yeah. Okay, so that's more or less some of that we expect you to be looking at. Passwords. You know, these days, if you are going to be commenting about something in a specific area, there are certain things that I expect you to know at a minimum. Right now, if you have many conversations, you are looking at the global landscape. Confirm Brexit is a password. If you say you don't know nothing about Brexit, you didn't look very stupid, you didn't need to read. So buzzwords are saying there are certain things that you are expected to be aware of, isn't it? We are not saying become experts in those areas, but at least be aware of what's happening within those particular areas. So there are a number of them, so social media, ethics, <coughs> IT, recent high governance, cyber security, disruptive technologies, and risk to, to business. So, right now, between now, when I get into pre-release for the ABC, so between now and the 15th of November, just take time to think about these things. Where you don't have, a, where you don't have pressure, case that pressure, rather than trying to read around these things during the five days. You won't have the you won't have the time. So I'm sure you're giving some links there to read around the industrial revolution. So now, where to? So between today and 11, reflect on assessment two as well as the south. Finish the work class nine, prepare for class ten, and attending class ten. And I put my emphasis. I'm sure they've missing the weekly study plan. That was that is the shade of APT assist. For those who haven't seen it, please it has been uploaded. Make use of that study plan. So that at least you keep up with, with your momentum. And don't slacken towards the, the APC. So the usual steps, fine tune your eye in as you said in it. part of a practice case study. Right, reflect on task A and B and prepare for the rest of the task. And then, work, class, work through class 10. Is class 10 online or you are going to get a piece of contact session? Online. So this is the last contact session. Okay, so on the day where you expect to go through class 10, please make sure you go through class 10. And I know the moment people are told that the class is supposed to be watched online, what do we do? We just download the video and we pack this. So I'm going to find a day where I'm going to sit down and watch the video. And that day never comes. Before you know it, it's not the 15. And they have not yet watched the final class. And you're not trying to squeeze the class within the five days to be speed up. Who doesn't work in it? But already, you are now panicking about preparing for the, for the case start. So I would say, this is more or less about it in terms of our class nine. And before we wrap up, I put an important announcement from ICAPS. So they say today is the last day of your registration for the APC 2019 exam. So if you have not yet done so, or if you do not know you have been registered, please just check in with ICAPS whether you have not you have been registered. Maybe your training office the one doing it on your behalf. If you are not sure whether you have been registered, don't just sit back. This is your life you are talking about, isn't it? <laughs> Pick your phone and four icons. Can you please check my name on the list of residents students? 
If you are not there, then you follow up with your chain more business. Because I know it's up in Zimbabwe to say, ah, Germany, they are going to extend it. But it may not always be the case. So I thought, please take all that important announcement. The second one, um, secular is some registers, so please make sure that you've signed the registers. Your training office is one confirmation that you're actually here, not gallivanting in town. <laughs> so make sure that you've signed the register. Okay, that's it for me. Any questions from anyone? Yes. Um. I noticed with case study too, like with industry research, and I really struggle. Is do you need to have that order of starting with your industry research, or you can just have general stuff and start with your technical? Because usually there is a link, but the link is so small. It's, it's struggling. Why did you struggle? What were the issues? I couldn't find enough information. What were you looking <laughs> I was looking for pastel around the logistics and uh, looking at competitor information, industry outlook, all of that. Okay, remember my advice is, after you get through this first class, when you do a industry research, you need to have the questions, come on, fair. If you are able to come to me and that I had this question and I couldn't find information on this question, if you can talk. But normally this is what we do. We just go in with it. We expect to find that this way, this one package with all the information about the industry. So for example, you can have a question, who is the industry representative body for the freight industry? To have some form of association. Why am I looking for that association? Chances are, if I want industry statistics, who compiles those industry statistics? Association. The association. So you can have questions that can lead you to identify sources of information. So that's a good example. There was the legislature, I think, if you then went on the page, it would lead you to another page, and that page has no information. The page would what? Like the, is it? I forgot the actual The association? Yeah. Okay, you have not found the association. But what information do you want to find from that association? You <laughs> see now, that's why you get a good start. You say you just wanted the association, but do you know what information you wanted to find? If you know the information, you then ask yourself what alternative sources can I consider? So it's more about getting those simple short questions. Then one question would trigger another one. Another question, hopefully, and we are gathering your the information is as you go. So I know which is why you normally wait for that SAF out. Well, the that is right, everything has now been consolidated, it's now in a look, lovely looking document. But to get that information, research was done, and you need to have research questions. Don't just Google. Transport industry in Zimbabwe. <laughs> <laughs> or freight industry in what? In Zimbabwe. Then you wait to Walla and just going to find all the things that I want. What do you want to know about the transport industry in? Type those questions. Yep. But okay, I get that. So my question still stands in terms of can I do it the opposite way. Can I start with the technical? Okay, you can feel like I'm limited in my industry. Because I notice when you're looking so much for industry research, you can end up just getting a mental block and then you're now panicking in the last two days trying to compile because you've been over focusing on industry research that you're struggling to find. You're just getting bits and pieces, but it's not enough. So is it better to say, I'm going to start with my technical exhaust that and then move on to the industry and do as much as I can on that and then link it back? For me, for five days, allocate time to the activities you want to do within the five days. Yep. Even if maybe you've allocated eight hours of industry research, even if you think you've not done enough, move on to the next one's activities. But the most important thing is, 
after the five days, have you done everything that you're supposed to have what? Because you find it as a said you will never be enough. If you talk to candidates why in South Africa, they will tell you, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I've done enough. Or they also tell that information I could at least could quite get it. But when you are sitting in what are you saying? Ah, those guys are better over there. It's very easy to get information, you know what? In essay. But it's less more about the information but about our research skills. But allocate time. And even the triggers, once you have identified the triggers, plan. When are you going to do which trigger? How much time are you allocating to each individual? So by the time five days, don't they say the last night you are still waiting on a trigger? Yet the last night you are supposed to be refreshing, you know, sitting at home watching your favorite series. In preparation for a growing eight hour day. <coughs> Alright, another question. Okay, now, okay, thank you very much for coming through. And if you don't meet again physically, all the best in your APC 2019. And remember to sign the registers. So,